Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, inspiring, getting us off going this morning. Um, so the first panel, as we sit down, is on preventing and responding to violence. Um, as many of you know, Boston, uh, over the last second, several decades, has been a leader in this, both nationally, internationally, particularly around issues of community policing, and now around dealing with uh, the effects of Boston. Um, but let me not uh, steal the panel's thunder and instead hand it over to Paula Jones. Thank you very much, and uh, it's wonderful to be here today, and we're going to jump right in because we are running late, and that's a a message to our wonderful, amazing panelists that we're going to have to try our best to uh, stay on time so that I think we can really uh, end this with some really rich uh, discussion. Very briefly, uh, Anthony Braga, who's right to my left, is a senior uh, research fellow in the program in criminal justice policy and management at the Kennedy School, and he's also a professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Rutgers University. Um, and he has really bridged this gap, and I think is, is a prime example. Um, he has served as the chief police, uh, policy advisor to the commissioner, Edward Davis, of the Boston Police Department. Uh, and Dr. Braga had been very active uh, in really figuring out ways to address violence uh, in the city of Boston uh, in the 1990s. Next, we're gonna hear from Daniel Linsky, uh, in uh, 2007, he was uh, appointed as the superintendent in chief of the Boston uh, Police Department, which oversees the Bureau of Field Services. And uh, in this role, he has primary responsibility for the implementation of community policing and the delivery of effective and efficient police services in the community. Next, we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Felton Earls, who we all know as Tony. Uh, Dr. Earls is a professor of human behavior and development at the Harvard School of Public Health and professor of social medicine and child psychiatry at the Harvard uh, Medical School. And Dr. Earls is really, you're going to hear about his work, he's really done some fascinating and very important work uh, understanding uh, youth uh, in the city of Chicago, but has also done uh, some very interesting uh, field work uh, in studying um, HIV uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, primarily uh, Tanzania. So you've got this local and global connection that I think will be interesting um, in terms of, of learning in different uh, settings. And uh, Dr. Deborah Allen is the director of the Bureau of Child, Adolescent, and Family Health at the Boston Public Health Commission. And the Boston Pub uh, Public Health Commission is the city of Boston's public health department and is responsible for all of the health of the city of Boston. She is in charge of the childhood mental health programs, school health, youth development, and community and domestic violence programs. She also has had a, a career that has shifted in, at different times and came to the commission um, from the BU School of Public Health where she was an associate professor of maternal and child health. So with that, I really uh, wanna thank and welcome our esteemed panel, and we're gonna start with Anthony Braga. I've been working with the Boston Police Department for uh, 17 years now on a series of different projects ranging from preventing gang violence to trying to understand where criminals are acquiring firearms and disrupting those illegal gun markets that are serving them to doing an evaluation of a pretty innovative prisoner entry program that was done in collaboration with the Suffolk County House of Correction and a whole cadre of uh, community-based and social service providers. Uh, the thing that really links all of these projects that I've worked on with the Boston Police Department has been mutual interests. As an academic, there are a lot of different theoretical questions that I'm interested in learning more about in the city of Boston. So for example, today I'm going to talk to you about the distribution of violence across neighborhoods, something that criminologists and soci sociologists and others have struggled with for a decade, a decade, a century or more, very, very long time. Uh, and I'm also very interested in program evaluation trying to develop a, a knowledge base on evidence-based policy and what seems to work in criminal justice responses to addressing violence in neighborhoods. For the police department, they have common interests in this agenda as well. And Chief Linsky will talk about that, but primarily they're interested in understanding the nature of violence in neighborhoods so they can de deploy their resources uh, more wisely in an effective way and also uh, try and develop new information projects to try and uh, innovate 
and develop new and more effective practices. In keeping this relationship strong, I tend to value the relationship as much or more than any of the results that are generated from the relationship. And the way I operate with the city of Boston and the police department in particular is I try and be very sensitive to the political environment and operational environment that they work in, which is very complex and very challenging. And over the years, has been a, a, an inspiring and educational experience for me. I've learned a tremendous amount by being involved uh, with the city of Boston and the Boston Police Department. And I also try and be consistent. Uh, I go to all of the major Boston Police Department meetings, whether it's CompStat, their bureau chief meetings, any special meetings out in the districts that they're having with community groups or any of their criminal justice partners, uh, so I can develop that trust you know, that, that I'm there. And I take a lot of requests as well. Two or three times a month, I'll get a call from Chief Linsky, Commissioner Davis, one of the captains, just asking me if I can do a policy analysis or if I can attend a meeting and uh, bring some uh, a different voice to what's being discussed at that meeting. So the project I'm going to talk to you about today uh, looks at hot spots of violent crime in the city of Boston. And generally, if you just do a simple slice on a yearly basis of hot spots, these are shooting hot spots in the city of Boston, you see roughly 5% of the city experiences 50 to 60% of the shootings in any given year. Uh, the question, though, that we wrestled with, and this came right from a bureau chief's meeting where I happened to be there and uh, the, the different commanders were talking about hotspots policing and investments of resources over the long haul, was it kind of, I guess it felt to them like they were playing whack-a-mole, that they were putting resources in particular areas, violence would go down, then it would spring up in another area, they would withdraw and they would come into that area again, and they were wondering uh, about the stability of, of the violence over time. And I said, you know, yeah, if you give me access to some of your programmers, we can actually do some research and answer that question. That's something that, that's definitely within our reach. And I just want to, as an example of this, draw your attention to Grove Hall, which is a very important neighborhood in the city of Boston, really a success story in uh, urban revitalization. And last year it was a hot spot, not the hottest hot spot, it had 14 shootings. The year before that, it was the hot, hottest spot in 2009. It experienced 25 shootings uh, in that year. And in 2008, uh, there wasn't much violence there at all. Experienced four shootings in the area. And you can also look at the distribution of uh, the shootings around the area. It moves around a little bit, but generally there's a lot of stability there. So what we ended up doing was breaking the city into very, very small units of analysis, street block faces and intersections, and then uh, we counted 29 years worth of shootings to each of those uh, small units, and I'll keep the nerdy academic stuff to a minimum. Uh, we did growth curve regression models just to see uh, whether the trends at these small units were stable over time. Uh, so this is the punchline. Uh, basically we observed two different types of places that were causing recurring shootings over time in the city of Boston. One was a volatile group, which had rapid upturns and downturns, but consistently generated a lot of shootings. And the other were stable. Year in and year out, they generated roughly the same amount of shootings. But when you aggregate the street intersections and the uh, block faces that make up those two groups, it's only 5% of the city. And over that 29-year period, it generated 74% of all the shootings. The same places over and over and over again. The worst 50 experienced over 1,000 shootings during that time period. I can't imagine being a resident on one of those blocks. And you can see that the run-up in violence during the crack epidemic in Boston up to the peak in 1990, the decrease, and then the resurgence of violence that we experienced in the middle part of the 2000s, all happened in just 5% of the city. So the implications are pretty clear. I brought this information back to the Bureau Chief's meeting, and I said, well, it is true, you are playing whack-a-mole in the city, but you're only playing whack-a-mole in 5% of the city. And the challenge to the department really is, what do you do to make those investments to try and change what's going on in the 5% of the city? And also, this is a project that I've been working on with a very talented PhD student and friend of mine, David Haro, looking at the context of these shooting hotspots. And I'm sure Tony Earls will talk a little bit about collective efficacy, but these places are characterized by very low levels of collective efficacy. These communities are uniquely vo uh, vulnerable, and they also need the police help more than other places in the city. But unfortunately, there are also, and we got this data from the Harvard School of Public Health surveys, 
uh, have high levels of legal cynicism, a lack of trust with the police department. So in order to do those community-based type strategies that can really make a difference, the police department's going to have to take that extra step and really try and connect with the community in a different way. And it's not just shootings. Other form of violent crimes also have this distribution. Uh, did the same thing with robberies over a 29-year period. And you see that 8% of the street robberies occur in just two-thirds, uh, generate just two-thirds, over two-thirds of all of the street robberies. And only 1%, and this is really concentrated because for commercial robberies, you need a venue to rob. Only 1% of these small street units experienced over 50% of all the robberies over time. So clearly, you really want to make longer-term investments in these areas. And that's precisely what Commissioner Davis did uh, shortly after taking the reins of the, of the Boston Police Department. Uh, he implemented a program known as the Safe Street Teams program. And given limited resources, he was only able to do this in 13 hotspot areas, which for me, even though I'd like to see the entire city covered, was fundamentally good news because it left an opportunity to do a rigorous evaluation because the whole city was not covered. And these teams, which uh, Chief Linsky will talk about a little bit more, one sergeant, six officers, permanent assignments to get to know the residents there, be visible, do community problem solving, connect with the residents, try and change those underlying dynamics in those places that cause crime problems to recur. So making those longer term investments, doing policing in those neighborhoods, not acting like firefighters and moving from place to place to place, making that investment in the neighborhood. And we jointly applied for some funding from the Bureau of Justice, Statistics, uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance uh, to do an evaluation of the program. And as important as the impact evaluation to determine whether it really was having an impact was a process evaluation that we did, where we interviewed sergeants, we did ride-alongs, we viewed the places. And what we found was that generally, the officers were trying to make these connections with the community members. They were trying to change a lot of those situational characteristics you know, overgrown bushes, uh, abandoned buildings, vacant lots, those types of characteristics of a place that make them attractive to commit crimes and make those connections with the community to increase the informal social control in those areas to keep the area safe. Uh, but it wasn't even across all the places. And this was really important information to discover uh, for the uh, Boston Police Department's management of the program. We found that certain places where sergeants were really, who were supervising the teams, bought into the strategy uh, we're doing a really good job, uh, a lot of community-based action. In other locations where the sergeants didn't buy into the strategy as much, we saw much lower levels of this type of desirable community-based problem-solving action. And also we identified uh, issues with training. You know, people cycle in and out of the teams. Up front, there was a very powerful training program, and some of the officers, it wasn't quite clear to them what they should be doing. So I brought this information back to the chief, and he immediately started looking at who was supervising the teams, moving people around, putting together training programs to ensure that there was integrity to the program. Uh, and we also did a, a very rigorous impact evaluation, as I said, because it didn't cover the entire city. And I won't bore you with the academic details of this, but we did propensity score matching to identify street units that looked a lot like the places that received the program. And I looked at this over a 10-year period, looking at the trends over the longer haul using these growth curve regression models and difference in differences estimators. And what I found, the punchline was that the program was associated with a 17% reduction in violent crime in these areas, mostly driven by robberies and reductions in aggravated assaults, relative to similar places that didn't receive this sort of treatment elsewhere in the city. And we also looked at immediate spatial displacement because there's this criticism of focused policing that if you push down on crime here, it's just gonna pop up around the corner. Uh, there's a growing body of, 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 of uh, practical experience and evaluation evidence that shows that that's not true, and it wasn't true here in the city of Boston. We didn't see any significant displacement into the areas that were immediately surrounding these places. Uh, so, so all this information as it was being produced was brought back to the chief, the commissioner. They had me do presentations to the captains in the various districts uh, to show them that this sort of place-based community problem-solving type of approach really generates a lot of value. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Linsky, who's going to continue talking about our relationship. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Anthony. I, I got to tell you, I, when Anthony talks about propensity score matching and reverse 
growth curves. It, it, I mean, it's, that's where I live. Um, so I'm a police officer, and um, why would I want to partner up with, with a Harvard researcher on crime? I've taken a civil service test. I did well. I went to a police academy. I learned every statute and figured out whether I could arrest somebody or not arrest somebody. And I have been pretty proficient at beating paper targets with my firearm. So I pretty much know everything I need to know about crime. Um, and we at the police, we, we're very open to outside eyes and people coming into our agency. Um, <laughs> police officer has a, a motto that, how do you know when a suspect is lying to a police officer? Essentially when he's talking to them. We're very cynical of a lot of people. <laughs> <clears throat> but I knew where violent crime was occurring in Boston, and, and I thought, as an early police officer, if I went and applied the statutes that they told me, and if people were committing those crimes, I would just arrest them, and that should take care of the problem. Right? Eventually, we'll arrest all of the people committing the crimes, and the crime will go away. That didn't happen. Um, and we can't see it ourselves because we live it. So having somebody that can come into our organization and look at it from outside eyes and have us look at things a different way uh, is, is priceless. And um, the nature of violent crime uh, is, is bigger than the police department. It's involving the community and it involves the academic community as well. Um, we do a lot of things and as Anthony said, we were great at filling neighborhoods with police officers, which we thought okay, if there's a bunch of police officers and we're making arrests, well, that's effective crime management. Uh, but we were occupying neighborhoods. We weren't policing them. Uh, we were giving, well, how do we measure the productivity of those officers when they occupy a neighborhood? Well, how many arrests, how many tickets, how many people do they stop and frisk? None of those that I know of is a good experience for the citizen in that neighborhood. Uh, and in fact, maybe goes to the reason why they don't trust us and don't communicate with us as much. Um, so we started to look at crime differently and, and figure out why it's happening and where it's happening and what we need to do to fix it. And the commissioner uh, developed a safe street strategy and those police officers don't leave. The crisis comes as a four-year-old shot in Harambee Park. Those officers don't leave their assignments and go down there to try and deal with that crisis. They stay with the community and they build relationships and they build trust. And that's, if, if you're gonna take a page from Anthony Bragger, I think the building trust is, is probably key. Um, he had to build trust with, with us, the senior leaders in the police department, to make sure that he was giving us good guidance and, and uh, good information, because we've got scarce resources. And if it's not working, I need to make sure that I'm putting my maximum resources uh, in the places where they need it. Um, and he built trust up and down the line with the police, with the cop on the street. And Anthony has gone out on bicycles and foot and walked with my officers, and just like we learned from the professor from Harvard, he learned from the cops on the street as to why some of the stuff that we read in books or attend in seminars might not apply in some of the neighborhoods we work at when you look at the facts and circumstances the police officers work in every day in the city of Boston. Uh, and it's <clears throat> incredible experience for both of us to learn from each other and to look at the problems of violence with, with uh, different eyes and, and pointing things out to each other. Uh, it's, it's helped us with credibility. Uh, credibility with the community, credibility with the media, uh, credibility with, with other organizations. For example, we uh, were approached by the ACLU, um, and I guess you're not an efficient police executive leader if you don't have the ACLU questioning about something. Um, and they were concerned about our stops, our uh, frisks and, and stops of uh, people in the community. And they'd done a study of New York, and they grabbed the data from New York and said, it looks like there's a disparate amount of stops of uh, uh, young men of color who are being stopped by the police department in New York. And that went to the media and there's a, uh, a whole impact that came from that. Uh, and they came to Boston and they were looking to do the same study. And we said, we think that'd be great. Uh, we have Dr. Bragger who works with us. He's got access to our information. He could put that study, that information you want to look at, he could put it in context. Because if the majority of the officers doing the stops are gang unit officers who are assigned to investigate gang violence and they're working in neighborhoods plagued by gangs, and the majority of the gang members 
our uh, kids of color, well, that's probably going to, to skew our statistics. And we probably have some problems there that we need to address and we should look at. We want to make sure it's in context and, and, and gives us some meaningful results when it comes out. And when they knew that we had Anthony at the table and, and were willing to look at our information, they said, no, it sounds like a good idea. Maybe we should do a, a slower down uh, look at this and, and make sure the information's right so that the outcomes uh, are meaningful. Uh, we need to know. Like, a lot of times in my office, they don't want to tell the chief he's got no clothes on, right? Good news, bad news, uh, I need to hear it all. If what we're doing isn't working, we don't want to keep going down that road. If, if we thought we had a, a great idea um, and it's you know, not such a good idea, we need to fix it. And having truthful uh, conversations going back and forth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is, is key to these partnerships. Uh, the first hand experience, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and the fact that we have the limited resources that we need to do. Um, you gotta talk to us on our level. Uh, I need to cut through all of the study you did and figure out, okay, where do I put my cops, when do I put them there, and what should they be doing when they get there? And uh, I need action items. Uh, because we deal with the stuff that goes on every day. Houses blow up, people get run over, stabbings occur, shootings occur, police officers are involved in uh, use of force that we have to investigate. And having time to look out for the long term and making sure we're making smart deployment decisions, uh, sometimes we, we, we sacrifice that for getting involved in day-to-day -day operations. So <clears throat> giving us clear direction is, is something we're always looking for. Um, Anthony's partnership with us has been longstanding. Uh, he started when, when the Boston Miracle was created. Uh, I didn't even know we were working on a miracle. I missed the, uh, the memo. Uh, but I was a drug cop who was banging down doors. And I would uh, arrest people involved in narcotics investigations and, and gun trafficking. And I was arresting bad guys. I don't know why I was arresting the bad guys, except for the fact that my informants told me these guys would sell them drugs and guns and I could get a search warrant. But I wasn't targeting them because they were bad guys. As luck had it, a lot of my detectives come up with cases that, that were targeting impact players in our neighborhoods, but we didn't know it. It was luck. Uh, once we started looking at what's driving violence in the city of Boston and looking at places that are driving violence and people that are driving violence, we could better target our resources at those people. As a, as a narcotics cop, if you know, we, my informant could tell me that we could get kilos of cocaine from somebody, that's, that's, the, that's like the African uh, safari hunter with his big trophy prize. The more kilos we put in the table, uh, the better we thought we were doing. When in fact, that organization might not be involved in violence, they had their economic things going on, but they weren't shooting individuals. And, and Dr. Bragger and his research has helped us focus on where we should be focusing our resources and who we should be focusing those resources on. Um, and it's a, a, an amazing partnership that goes on to this day to where he makes me look good at Comstat by emailing me questions of, don't you want to ask um, why this is going on over here? <laughs> well, yes, I do. <laughs> so uh, that, that's it for me from BPD, and I'm sure we'll open up for questions. And thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> and next we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Tony Earls. Uh, well, I earned my urban stripes by being a resident citizen of the South End in the 1970s. And I could spend the next 15 minutes talking about the decisions I made, my family made, to live in the South End, and decisions we made 10 years later to move out of the South End, and decisions that we wish we could have made to move back into the South End 10 <laughs> years later. <laughs> Uh, that's reimagining Boston, I think. <laughs> um, so I want to do a sort of complex thing. That I want to squeeze 20, 20 years of research and 20 years of uh, experience as a researcher into 10 minutes. And uh, to do that, I have to do two things. One is to pay credits <coughs> to a, a large group of people who worked with me on these projects. Uh, the one in Chicago uh, was uh, collaborated. Um, my, my major collaborators were Rob Sampson and Steve Roudenbush, and I don't know if Steve is here yet, um, and Jean Brooks Gunn. And in the last 10 years, it's been Mary Carlson, my wife, uh, who's worked with me in Tanzania, as Paula was saying. Um, 
So uh, let me see how this goes. Um, we started with a, um, a sort of resistance on the part of public health authorities to call violence an epidemic because the public health service restricted the use of epidemic to infectious disease phenomena and were reluctant to think about it in terms of public health. Uh, our collaboration with criminologists and sociologists, uh, starting with Al Reese and Rob Sampson, uh, allowed us to make a bridge between public health and criminology in designing the project on human development in Chicago neighborhoods. And this map helped. It helped the public health, it helped the CDC and the NIH to realize that the, distribu that the distribution of violence was one that fit an epidemic model. Th these are census tracts, 860-odd census tracts in Chicago with geocoded uh, plots of where violence victimization occurred. And the map was, uh, was uh, developed by Jeff Sampson, uh, by uh, Jeff Mornov. But to make the issue of violence more contextual in terms of understanding um, how it might be operating, it was important to bring in a public health variable that was understood by public health and to show that from a spatial point of view, there was uh, a high level of sp spatial correlation between these two phenomena. Now at the individual level and the family level, there's very little, there's very little overlap in risk factors between a mother giving birth to a low birth weight baby and a young, perhaps African American man losing his life at the age of, tw in, in his early 20s. But the spatial, the spatial correlation of these two maps suggests that there's something in the community, something in the social environment that operates through the individual factors, maybe operating independently through the uh, individual factors to cause this outcome. So our dilemma was to how to conduct a study of children growing up in Chicago that would link phenomena like low birth weight, reading achievement, um, behavioral problems, mental health, drug use, with uh, these outcomes that were very important to criminologists and to the police force and to uh, sociologists in, in crime. Uh, to do that, we did a multi-level study, uh, longitudinal study, which I think has been celebrated uh, in many ways. And this map is one of the products of that uh, of that project, where in 1997 we were ready to begin publishing on, on collective efficacy. Now, let me just define briefly what collective efficacy is, because uh, Rob and I wrote a paper in 1999 called Beyond Social Capital. And what we're trying to do is get away from the idea that cities are like villages, you know, where everybody knows everybody and their multiple roles, and there's a stock if you will, of good relations or poor relations if it's low social capital, to envision a parameter that didn't require people to know each other very well, but was based on a belief or a sense of control that you, that your residents, that your neighbors would act for the common good if it were called, if, if, it, was, if it was necessary to do that. So the kinds of questions we asked in these surveys were, do you believe that people who live around you, do you believe that your neighbors would take action if they saw a child spray painting graffiti or missing school or an old person crossing the street or the city deciding to close a fire department in your neighborhood? We scaled that score with some degree of precision, and I think this is the importance of our work, is the measurement aspect of it, uh, and showed uh, surprisingly in many ways because I think our view of Chicago was pretty dim, that there, were, that there was high collective efficacy. The blue areas are high collective efficacy, the gray areas are median on the scale, and the red areas are low collective efficacy. And this collective efficacy was a driver, if you will, of homicide rates, and later we were able to connect 
the out to we'll, we're able to collect in the multi-level analysis collective efficacy to a whole series of other outcomes, including low birth weight, reading scores, and um, very importantly for the work that I was going to do in Africa, to age of sexual initiation um, and to STDs. So the Chicago work, if you will, set the stage theoretically to understand that collective efficacy was an important dynamic, independent dynamic, operating at the community level. Uh, and the next question that followed was, well, if that's the case, how do you generate it? And it was that work that took me to, uh, to Tanzania. Now, it wasn't an arbitrary decision to choose Tanzania. And one of the reasons I wanted to work there is because not only did they have a raging HIV epidemic that was as important to Sub-Saharan Africa as violence was to the United States, but it was a decentralized government that was decentralized down to units, population units of two to 3,000 people. So there was a possibility of conducting cluster randomized experiments in this, in this city that will allow us to carry a rigorous research design to our question about how to generate collective efficacy. So we had learned some things in Chicago from talking to young people, not just interviewing them, but getting to know their lifestyle. And one of the questions that, one of the issues that kept coming up in the work is that, you know, you adults formulate uh, issues that uh, you then tell us about but you, very, you rarely engage us as part of the solution. That we're the problem, we're the you know, early sexual matures, we are the violent ones who carry weapons, we are the school children who are uh, unruly. You're demonizing and marginalizing us, uh, but not involving us. And so the experiment to generate collective efficacy was one in which we wanted to involve in a legitimate and tangible way young adolescents before they became sexually active. I regard the early adolescent period as being a critical period in human development. So we involved 10 to 14 year old children from multiple communities in a randomized design in which uh, this curriculum called the Young Citizens Program, partly based on the theories of uh, Jürgen Habermas and the Martin Yusen, and also driven by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, engages children in knowledge disseminate, knowledge gathering and knowledge dissemination. But it's based on uh, a very thick curriculum that builds trust and group identity as a citizen at stage one. And at stage two, it introduces the children to their local governments so that they learn the leaders, they learn the geopolitical boundaries and functioning of the units. Uh, they learn how to gather data, they learn how to ask for data, and then, and then they prioritize problems. Now the problem they prioritized was one, of, one that had two objectives. One was to reduce stigma, because that was getting in the way of people being tested for HIV AIDS. And the second was to increase the rate of testing. Um, over a period of time, over a 28 week curriculum actually, we're able to show amazing results. I say amazing results because uh, when we started, these children were not activated at all. They were in classrooms of 100 students with one teacher, uh, rote learning, no initiation. Uh, and within four or five weeks of involving them in this curriculum, they became active, they became uh, interested. And we had outcomes at both the individual level of those who participated as well as the community level to see what impact deliberative and communicative self-efficacy that they had acquired had on the community. And I, these are just some findings that the children in the intervention group were able to express their opinions to other children in formidable ways to make their, eyes to, to, to make their ideas understood even when there was disagreement, to use rational discourse, and to listen to adults, to make adults listen to them. Uh, at the community level, the uh, results were that children could teach science as well as adults, that they could reduce stigma, uh, and interestingly, that they could control violence, which was uh, a surprising finding for us. 
for, for, for us. And so in terms of challenges and promises, what I've learned from this 20 years of work in Chicago and now in Tanzania that's been coherently driven by my understanding about collective efficacy is that it's very important to involve children as citizens. The children carry the label of students at school and children in their families. Uh, but in the community, they really don't have a definition. Uh, the, word, the word citizen is usually can be slapped onto it at the back of a child, but can it be legitimately operationalized in terms of the identity, functioning, and activities of children? That's the challenge. And I think the promise is that if that can be done, that all kinds of good work uh, happens because they help in a multi-generational context to generate collective efficacy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Earls. And now we're going to have Dr. Allen. Good morning. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am from the Boston Public Health Commission, as Dr. Johnson mentioned. Um, and I'm going to be talking really, I think, a, a, a very nice extension of the previous talk about uh, violence as a public health problem. Um, clearly, violence has an impact on the immediate victims. That's, that's the obvious uh, sort of place it shows up in terms of public health outcome. But I think it's important to recognize its broader consequences and what makes it there are, I, I'm the director of a bureau that deals with child, adolescent, and family health. And one of the three divisions in my bureau is the Division of Violence Prevention. So clearly, we've elevated that to a great deal of importance. We think it matters a lot. And I want to make the case to you of why we think it matters so much, given that on the great scheme of things, the number of people who are actually killed directly by violence is, is relatively small. So first, if you look immediately past those people, of course, you find people who are also injured, who are not killed but who are um, disabled as a result of violence. Beyond them, you find the families and friends of those who are victims who are extremely vulnerable to mental health consequences of that experience, to PTSD, to trauma, to lifetime stress experiences, um, and who are also at heightened vulnerability to get involved in violence if they are in the right demographic group in the sense of revenge. So the proximity to violence very much along the lines of what Dr. Earls was talking about, about uh, violence as an epidemic breeds violence just as there's a contagion issue in infectious disease. And then finally, and really most interestingly to us, there's the question of what violence does to the community as a whole. So Dr. Earls talked about instability in a community breeding violence. But what does violence do to the stability in the community? It's a, it's a two-way relationship. So I want to say a little bit as I go on about, about what we know about that. Um, first, about violence itself. Because I'm, or I would argue that violence affects health in the broader community through stress, people don't sort of have a stressful experience and drop dead immediately. So it's, it's, you'd have to look for a very long time to say, what's the cumulative effect of, of violence on, on heart disease, for example? But one group of people who show sort of physiological response very quickly are fetuses. And this point that Dr. Earls made about the proximity, the overlay between low birth weight and violence, we believe increasingly has to do with stress experienced by the mother who lives in violent, a violent area. And one very, very interesting study that got people thinking about this, and th there's a broad discussion we could have about persistent black-white disparities in birth outcomes in the United States, of which Boston is a prime example, that don't get easily explained by the usual suspects people think about when you think about birth outcomes, don't explain, get well explained by prenatal care, by smoking, by the other things people think are causal factors there. But we're left with this difference that even persists when you control for class that has blacks and whites having different levels of adverse birth outcomes. And increasingly, we've begun to look at stress. And one of the really interesting studies uh, that, that got people thinking this way had to do with looking at birth outcomes in Chile 
in 1982 at the height of the violence and finding that when you controlled for all of the predictors they knew of, and they didn't have you know, major racial differences, so that wasn't a causal factor, when you controlled for class, controlled for education, access to care, you found that women who lived in neighborhoods where there was a great deal of political violence going on had higher levels of preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant mortality utterly fascinating and revolutionary in terms of our usual ways of thinking about what causes people to have low birth weight babies. And you know, it's the fact that the baby is born after nine months in utero that you can see an outcome that's so proximate to the causal factor of violence. But there aren't a lot of studies that look at that because the other kinds of outcomes happen so much later. So we have to make a sort of causal chain that goes from violence to stress, which we do know is associated with violence. We know that communities with high levels of violence experience high levels of mental health problems related to stress. And then from stress to adverse health outcomes of a, w a wide variety of types. And it's that link between violence to stress to adverse outcomes that really makes violence such a central preoccupation. Because if you trace out those disparities in exposure to violence, disparities in birth outcomes, track the baby who's born preterm because of the mother's exposure to violence for 50 years, you're going to find a black man who's vulnerable to death from heart disease 20 years earlier than he might have been had his mother not had that experience in utero. So violence suddenly becomes not just a matter of the individuals most directly affected, but a pervasive part of our lives. And in fact, that's not just limited to the communities where, they, where it's a hot spot. Every one of us, I'm sure, you've all had the experience of walking down a street and feeling tense because you might be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you have to think about what does it mean to children growing up in that environment where they're, where they're walking down that street all the time. That's their daily experience. So for us in public health, this question of violence becomes a very central one. This is the most obvious um, uh, of those effects of violence, this, um, let's see, can I? This is the, um, the rate of death from uh, homicide among black men aged 20 to 24, uh, 18 to 24 in Boston. And you can compare it to black females. Um, this is Latino males. Um, this is white males. And so you see certainly a gender difference, but the overwhelming finding here is the significance of homicide as a cause of death among young black men. This is, this is a slide that I included just because I find it fascinating. I don't have an explanation for it. So this is by age group rather than by race. So this is black males. And interesting what we find is that among the youngest children, zero to four years old, black males still explain almost all of the homicide. I have no explanation for that, and I don't know that it's been studied, but it still is a fascinating uh, finding and one we should, we should think about and look, about, uh, look at. And in terms of understanding this sort of proximate exposure to violence and the resultant impact on stress, this is research on high school students in Boston asking how many had ever had a close family member or friend killed by violence. And let, let me ask, how many of you have had a close family member or friend killed by violence? So a, a, a small number, a number, but a small number. So 48% of Boston high school students have had that experience. I mean, I just, that, that is overwhelming in terms of what kids go around thinking on a day-to-day -day basis about their own life expectancy, their own ability to participate and be efficacious in their community when that reality is hanging over their heads. Um, so this is a, a sort of much repeated in public health or much uh, uh, copied um, slide from a study by Ewan about um, the impact of stress on health outcomes using the term allostatic load to describe the consequence of cumulative stress over time on human physiology. And the, the point that this makes is normally, this is you kind of walking along the street, um, a lion or an SUV comes at you, 
your stress level increases, the lion or the SUV goes away, your stress level comes down, you're back to a homeostasis, you're normal again. And, and that happens to you a few times a week. It happens on a small scale every day. And it's perfectly normal and, in fact, uh, 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 healthy for that to happen. The argument that gets made about um, stress when it becomes excessive leads to allostatic load and then to adverse outcomes has to do with what happens when you are repeatedly confronted by the lion or the SUV or you are com repeatedly confronted by a, a variety of stresses so that you never actually return to base load, to, to baseline. You, your sort of normal for you becomes uh, a heightened level of stress, and that's hypertension. That's what we're looking at there, is people who are both physiologically adapted to stress, they live with stress all the time, and who are psychologically hypervigilant, who have all of the accompanying psychological features that go along with physiological stress. So our strategy at the Public Health Commission reflects our sense that we really have to address violence in the entire population. Um, and I think I thought about how to talk about this and thought it would be useful to use HIV as a model because it's probably the public health problem people are most familiar with. We have all been part of conversations about HIV and how to prevent it and whether we're vulnerable to it and how it might affect people we know. So first, clearly we would not address HIV without dealing with the people who are infected. Now in public health, there's the question of are the people who are infected the province of medicine? not our, they've got it. So prevention, which is our business, is, is not an issue. And in the, the analogy here would be to say, let's leave the guys who do the shooting to the police, hand them over to you and we won't worry about them. But if we're correct that this is a, a disease that spreads, we've got to pay attention to those people. We've got to, rec we've, we've got to figure out how to neutralize their potential to spread this problem to the rest of the population. So we need a public health strategy that deals with the people who are infected. We need a public health strategy that deals with people in their immediate surroundings who are the pipeline to those high impact players, um, who are the next people who are going to fill in the gap if we arrest the, the one we see now. Um, third is we need to think about, so for the HIV, those would be the partners of the people with HIV, or the people who share needles with people with HIV. Then there are those who engage in risky behavior, kids with STDs, so we know they're having unsafe sex, that would be the analogy. These are the kids who engage in risky behaviors in their communities and are likely to enter that pipeline. And then there's the broader community, and I want to sort of distinguish here between the broader community, meaning the people who live around <clears throat> these areas where there's pervasive violence, and then the broader population of the rest of us who don't live in those neighborhoods, but who impinge on those neighborhoods in, our, in terms of our attitudes. I mean, it's here the question is, does the rest of the country who isn't gay and doesn't use drugs worry about AIDS? Do we care about it? And clearly the answer there for many, many parts of the country was yes, that people got mobilized both to recognize that there wasn't a wall that protected them, but also that they ought to care about it as citizens of a common community. And so we need to have that attitude towards violence, that the 10 to 14 year old who looks a little scary to you is not your enemy, but is someone, is a child about whom you ought to be concerned. <clears throat> So we have programs that in the Public Health Commission that address every one of these uh, levels of in involvement with violence. At the most intense level, we actually work very closely with the police department on the PACT program, which focuses on the um, perpetrators of violence, those known to have histories of arrests, of, um, <clears throat> of uh, having been hospitalized for uh, injury related to violence, excuse me, <clears throat> Um, and the police do the policing part of a relationship to them. Our job is to see if we can disengage them from violence and work with them around addressing their education needs. Many of them have histories in special ed, and the pipeline involved to get where they are involved school failure, school absenteeism, truancy, and a great deal of disheartened uh, feeling about the future. Um, so can we engage with them around education, employment, family relationships, many of them have kids, how to work with their 
partners or the women who are the mothers of their children, how to raise, how to be fathers. <clears throat> so that's at the most uh, sort of severe end. We then have programs that uh, address those who are close to the violence, um, youth development programs that focus on kids at risk. For example, a program called the Youth Development Network that does home visits for kids who have high levels of absenteeism from school, recognizing that as a risk factor along the pipeline to be sort of imminently at risk for engagement in violence. And then, more typically in terms of what one would think about as public health, we have broad programs that aim at promoting child mental health, maternal and child bonding, parenting skills, uh, youth development in the, the sort of broader, more positive way, uh, and so on. Um, one thing we actually have very little of, and I was fascinated by Dr. Earle's presentation on this, is we've tended to focus very, very strongly on either young kids, because we see birth outcomes, because there's so much vulnerability in the early years, or teenagers, because they are the ones with the presenting behaviors that worry us. And there's tended to be a neglect of kids in between. So I'm very interested in this idea of a focus on 10 to 14 year olds and think we should, uh, we should uh, talk to Dr. Earls about that, about what we ought to be doing. We do look at academia, to academia for insight. I mean, everything that I've mentioned that we've done has been influenced by research. Uh, we are certainly involved with research on stress, birth outcomes, lifespan health, and trying to understand the relationship of that to violence. I have been fascinated lately by research looking at asthma, which is the most pervasive childhood uh, condition the largest cause of absenteeism from school and the most expensive childhood illness in the United States as a uh, consequence of stress. And if you drew the map for asthma pre prevalence that, that uh, Dr. Earl showed you for birth outcomes, I suspect it would look extremely similar in terms of its overlap with violence. We have been uh, directly influenced by Dr. Braga's work about uh, uh, crime prevention in Lowell, thinking about our own neighborhood-based program that attempts to build efficacy in areas of Boston with high levels of violence. So we certainly are interested in what researchers have to tell us, and we have lots of unanswered questions. One, uh, this is probably a little mysterious and looks like t a typo, a PPOR is uh, perinatal periods of risk. And when we look at pregnancy and birth outcomes, we recognize that there are certain periods pre-pregnancy, during gestation, in the first year of life, when mother and child are particularly vulnerable. I mean, the, the notion of cephalic acid in early pregnancy to prevent uh, um, uh, spinal uh, disability is an example. Um, and is there an equivalent for violence in the sense that if we intervene or assure that kids are in a good place at certain stages growing up, we can have a sort of major impact on uh, the outcome for them in terms of engagement in violence. We're very interested in the relationship of trauma to violence. So is it, does, does violence literally breed violence in the sense that being traumatized by exposure and the more proximate the, the exposure, the more intense the risk, is experiencing trauma a risk factor for violence? Methods and opportunities to engage families, how can we take advantage of families caring about their children to in, help them, help their kids not engage in violence? And then what are the roles for child-serving systems like our own education, early childhood, and care? Um, but there are real barriers to working with, uh, with academia. Uh, one is that you guys are a, a high price state. Um, you know, institutions with 62% overhead rates, um, sometimes it's just easier to go to an independent researcher who's not going to charge that kind of money. So th that is a very real, we, we don't have, uh, I mean, it, it's nice to think about the cities operating beautifully while the federal government you know, goes down the tubes, but the fact is that a lot of our money ultimately resides in the federal government and we do not operate fully independently, so money does matter. Um, second is that my own experience is, is of occasionally being involved in a partnership with a researcher who is so interested in publication that the questions that are of most important to me, which often may not be the ones, they, they often have to do with implementation which is not what the leading journals are fascinated by. So there can be a mismatch of interest. 
And the third is sort of opportunistic partnerships where somebody's interested in you while the research is hot and not really interested in developing uh, a, a long-term relationship where mutual knowledge feeds the kind of relationship we heard described before. And at the government end, I think, are two worst habits, and others may have uh, additional bad habits to add, are first, you know, the, the political predisposition to quick fixes, even when they are not supported by research, even inconsistent with research findings. And second, and sort of paradoxically, because it would seem to contradict the first, our tendency to get stuck in programs that we already have, not think quickly about how to reconstruct them when the research says they're not really what we need. Uh, so uh, both superficiality and stodginess, I think, are our own two worst uh, attributes. So some suggestions about how to address those questions. Well, the first, I think, is to make it easy for us to find the research that's out there. Um, we don't sit reading journals. Um, and so journals need to come to us. People need to tell us when they've got findings that are relevant to our work and make it easy for us to come to events like this and hear about them. Um, Harvard, I mean, has a wonderful set of health roundtables each one of which makes me want to go, and they cost seven, eight hundred dollars. It is extremely difficult in a public position to spend that kind of money on one person going to a seminar one day. So if you want us there, give us scholarships. Um, so again, dealing with the money. Um, third, I think, uh, be imaginative about not just the immediate consequences of research you do, but about where it might be relevant in another area that isn't what you were specifically addressing. So for example, this work that's being done on asthma is utterly fascinating to me when I'm thinking about how can I prove the benefits of a mental health intervention for mothers and children. It's Babies, little children, don't get hospitalized for mental health problems. So you can't prove a lot of cost savings around mental health efficacy by looking at mental health costs. But if stress causes asthma, and our intervention reduces stress, and asthma costs a lot of money, is it possible that we could use asthma research to prove the benefits of a mental health intervention? Well, we can only do that if the asthma researcher comes to us and says, have you ever thought of this? Um, nurture long-term relationships, the one you heard about is a case in point. Um, and then finally, and I think maybe most importantly, when we develop programs in the community, it is incredibly important that we build trust in the communities we're attempting to serve. And there is a great deal of skepticism in the communities we serve about research. What's the one research project that everybody in the city of Boston has heard about? Tuskegee. It, it is a, people who don't know where MIT is know Tuskegee. And so we need your help as researchers to convince the public, we want to do program evaluation, we want to do rigorous research, but we're not answerable to you. We're answerable to the community. And so the importance of really sort of helping us build ties to community residents about research as a, an instrument of liberation rather than research as an instrument of oppression is a really important role you can play with us. Uh, it's not one that you know, you write up in your grant, but it's one that becomes enormously important in our ability to work with you. Thanks. Dr. Allen, thank you. And I want to say thank you to all of these uh, incredible um, talks that we've heard this morning. I think that there is a tremendous amount here for uh, discussion. And um, I mean, wh what I heard just very briefly, I mean, there's this clear need for building trust building trust between the investigator and the practitioner, building trust between the research and the community, building trust really across so many boundaries. And that takes time and investment, and it's a topic that I really want to bring up because each of you, I think, has really been um, a real leader kind of on that leading edge of 
of how you did that. And I think talking a little bit about that process uh, is going to be important. So that's the first thing I'd like to get to as we begin at least our, our short discussion. And then, you know, I think th the other major theme around violence as a public health problem and um, really thinking about um, violence in terms of, yes, the perpetrators and, and how do you look at issues for the perpetrators, but then their immediate community, those family and those right around them, but then how do we begin to think about what the violence leads to, both short and in the much longer term, and that really then begins to get to um, this idea of the public health issues. And then how do we create, and I, I love the term, Tony, this uh, collective efficacy. Um, and, and really this focus, I think, that, that you had brought up around the 10 to 14 year olds. So really the perpetrator, those close, but then how do you, especially in a time of constrained resources, when we're really thinking about the immediate outcomes, think about the investment and the investment in, in that population. So maybe we can just start a little bit about this, this idea and notion of building trust and, and a little bit about how each of you has gone about doing that and what have been the upsides, some of the downsides, the learning process. I can. Tony. I can start. I was smiling at Rob Sampson when he was <laughs> saying that because uh, <clears throat> when we started the Chicago Project, I, I was warned by a colleague very seriously. And she took me by the arm at the end of a site visit that NIH was, was uh, conducting with us. She took me to the side. She said, you know, son, I don't know why she addressed me like that. Uh, <clears throat> but she said, son, you know, this thing is going to blow up in your face. The people in Chicago are tired of survey researchers coming out and collecting data about their families and their lifestyle and this sort of thing and publishing papers and, and then evaporating on us, basically. Um, but we took maybe three years of building trust, explaining our, explaining our intentions, our desires, our research design, uh, what we expected, what we thought some of the challenges were. We spent three years doing that before we collected a shred of data. I think it was extremely important in terms of building a relationship, not just with funders, <coughs> but with community representatives, representing churches, the police, health authorities, um, what we call reputational leaders. It's one of the concepts that Rob brought to us. Uh, people who are not positional leaders because they're in the police department or in the school department, but have gained a reputation in their neighborhoods. Uh, of people who speak out, who have the voice of the population that concern, you know, in concern and that sort of thing. So uh, I think this building trust is something that is uh, very important. We have no publications to show for the three years of work we did, however. Anthony. Well, I, I think some of the, the, the key ingredients I, I mentioned earlier was the, the consistency and the openness to doing research projects that are of direct interest to the partners that you're working with. Um, I mean, some of the strains, though, that, uh, that have developed is you know, when it's time to share bad news that something doesn't work. And I think I probably share bad news three times as much as I share the good news. And I, I feel like Debbie Downer sometimes in the Boston Police Department with all the bad news that I, I share about things that uh, could be happening more effectively or, or, or programs that may have not had the desired effects. And you know, I, I think in doing that permanence, uh, having those, that, that consistency and being there and, and framing things uh, in a way that um, is constructive. I find these agencies are, are, are very open to constructive criticism. They're very open to um, you know, hearing what's not going right. Uh, and having that trust to be able to speak openly about those things, uh, I, I think is, is incredibly important. And it's, it sometimes can be a, a source of strain in the relationships as well as the issue of, of funding a relationship rather than a project. Uh, one of the biggest challenges over the 17 years that I've had with the, the Boston Police Department has been just keeping the agenda going through funds. You know, during the 90s, you know, when times were fat and there was a lot of community policing money, it was pretty easy. Uh, right now, it's a challenge. Um, I have to rely on multiple different sources, and I take on a lot of projects uh, pro bono because it's the right thing to do. 
and I know uh, these are important questions that need to be answered, and it'll pay dividends down the road. Um, so those, those tensions around sharing bad news, as well as you know, keeping the relationship going through funding are, 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 are definite challenges. I, I, I want to just pick up, because I think it's a, a very important phrase, funding a relationship, not a project. Um, Chief Linsky. I think building trust um, from our department, Commissioner Davis had the experience of working with Anthony up in Lowell, and we had the experience in Boston, and I think we had to build the trust throughout the organization. I think the commissioner did that. And by the way, I should point out that he's in Chicago at IACP accepting awards for the great work from the Safe Street Team project that's been going on and uh, asked me to, to be here in his stead. But the commissioner put Anthony right in our office and put him as his direct uh, policy advisor and gave him a lead role in the department. So when the captains and the lieutenants and the shift commanders are looking at that, they see that that's, that's something that we value. And, uh, they see that the commissioner has put his trust and confidence in, in uh, the research and the outside eyes looking at us and that they should accept that inside the organization. Um, and again, it's, I, I think, three years of building relationships is exactly what you have to do. It's, it's learning each other and, and, and finding out what, what you can, the benefits that you can all bring to the table. Because we have this, the common goal. It's just how do we get there? Uh, and, and I think uh, working tirelessly at, at keeping those relationships honest and open uh, helps. Debbie, do you want to? I think I mean, sort of two kinds of trust. I mean, one is trust between academics and practitioners, and the other is between both and, and the community. In terms of the former, I mean, I, the, the point people have made about getting to know each other, and I, I think um, for researchers, it's enormously valuable if they understand the organization. I mean, if they really kind of know your org chart and how it works, because it means they're going to be realistic about what your per, what what your degrees of freedom are, and um, thinking through sort of what you can realistically do. Um, I think also flexibility. On, I mean, the, the people I like to work with best are people who can figure out something I can do when I have five thousand dollars to spend on evaluation as well as when I have $300,000 to spend on evaluation. Um, and, you know, obviously those are going to be different. We're not silly, but, but there still is something useful to be said, you know, for the $5,000 budget. And people who are willing to sort of stick with us through that are, are people I come to trust and rely on. Um, and people who will take a phone call just to chat just to answer, you know, to sort of think through something with me. I, I think it all, it all, this notion of uh, investing in the relationship and not just in the research is really a, a lot of what it's about. In terms of the broader community, I think it's the willingness of researchers to work with us on this time that's required to build trust, um, their willingness to be tactful, not to dominate discussions when we are having community meetings, um, to uh, support staff we hire who have expertise about the community and come from the community and maybe do some coaching of them about evaluation, which is where this comes up most often. You know, the, the, the person we hire because they have street smarts, not because they have a master's degree, may need some coaching about how to uh, connect the two. And so researchers who are willing to work with us on developing those relationships are, are key as well. I, you know, I think that one of the things that we, we don't have time in this panel to discuss it, but maybe looking towards the end of the day, and, and we've alluded to it, is this issue of funding and how do funders view relationship building and how do funders really support over the long haul this investment in the relationship, which is so important and frequently there are few, if any, dollars. And some of the way that we're seeing funding go now, especially, for example, from the CDC, where there's an investment in community or capacity building and there's a set of grants for that, but then once that's done, there's another competitive process where only half of those who've done the community building get the grant to do the work. And I, I think that we really have to begin to look differently um, at some of the funders. Can we talk for a few minutes around this notion of collective efficacy? Because the, I think that's a really important and eye-opening concept, and one in which as we think about looking at these tweens right, the 10 to 14 year olds. How might, I mean, look, that looks like an area that's ripe for partnership, investigation, action. What, what are your thoughts here for here in Boston? 
Anybody? Sure. Uh, well, well, from my field, policing and applied crime prevention, uh, it, it's clear that you know, police can have an impact if they're focused and they use a diverse set of tools, but in order for those uh, crime reduction impacts to take root and to last, it really needs to be taken on and, and, and carried forth by the community. Uh, the community needs to be involved in these efforts. The community needs to feel comfortable with communicating with the police department on what's going on in the neighborhoods. They gotta feel that the, the police department is sincerely interested in their experiences, both in terms of the, the daily quality of life in their neighborhoods, but also the quality of the policing services that they receive. So I think that police departments really have a, a key role and it's not just keeping communities safe in the short term, but also creating the conditions that can keep communities healthy and safe places over the long haul by fostering those types of connections uh, between the police and the public that they seek to serve. Tony. Uh, Paul, I just wanted to say that uh, the School of Public Health has an injury prevention center that has been very active in uh, studying, collecting data, and studying the issue of youth violence in Boston, I think for 15 to 20 years. Uh, and one of the innovations that they introduced, which is very important, is to gather information and collective efficacy from children's point of view. That all of the work we did in Chicago was, was uh, on adult perceptions of adult collective efficacy. But in terms of judging the quality of life of growing up in a city, uh, it's absolutely centrally important to get the perspective of young people. And so uh, he, here's, a, here's an issue where I think Boston is out in front because of the Injury Prevention Center. And I would really like to see that, that data source built on. It's an opportunity. I, I think um, the question of collective efficacy is a, is a, um, a critical one in our strategies for uh, addressing violence, um, one of, I mean, it, I think it come, it, it has to be linked somewhat to a question of individual efficacy. Um, I mean, I don't know if you can sort of, I mean, it's actually a question for you. We, we are doing, uh, we do a lot of work with, with pregnant women trying to produce optimal birth outcomes, and one of the things that we're beginning to look at is a strategy called problem-solving education that teaches women how to analyze, brainstorm, come up with potential solutions um, to things that otherwise may seem overwhelming to them. So I mean, just to put it, if you're a woman who gets out of bed in the morning, you're pregnant, your housing is insecure, you don't know if your car is going to start, um, your uh, blood pressure was up the last time you went to the doctor, you can feel overwhelmed before you've even stepped foot out of bed set foot out of bed. And so we're trying to teach women skills to take on those issues one by one so that they don't become overwhelmed. And I guess the question is, can you build collective efficacy if you, or, or is collective efficacy the product of doing that um, on a community level on, in some way? Um, it, it is clearly something we're trying to do in our VIP neighborhood program, um, but we would be, sort of very interested in insights about how to do it more effectively. Yeah, one of the limitations of so much social science research is that it's aggregative. It tends to aggregate, if you're looking at groups, you aggregate individual responses to get a group response. And I think collective efficacy is more than just individual efficacy aggregated up and summed over and averaged over a population. It really is the, the skill to communicate, exchange ideas, to change your position on issues when presented with new information. And, but one of the research challenges is how to capture that in a community. The, the context of, uh, of generating information and understanding it, being flexible towards your understanding so that you can shift positions. And the kind of work you're doing with this women's group, you know, where critical thinking and rational discourse seem to be so important. Uh, seems to me to be exactly the direction we want to take with collective efficacy mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. on, a commu on a community level, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna ask, um, we have microphones, and um, we're gonna take some a few questions, but while people are getting ready to raise their hand, I wanna ask one last question to Dr. Brogger and, and Chief Linsky, which is, you know, we saw the decrease, we saw the spike of violent crime in Boston in the 90s, we saw, 
the, 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 the use of interventions to see it decrease. We have another spike now. What do you think we're do you're doing differently today that will prevent these dips and, and, and peaks? Um, actually, the, the perception is is a spike, but we're actually down. We've been going down and trending down the last four years. We're probably this year on pace to meet a 10% reduction in crime, 13% uh, reduction in violent crime. One of our issues is that, that that's not out there. The perception, we can have all the great statistics uh, across the board, but if you don't feel comfortable walking to the store down in Grove Hall, um, that's what impacts the perception of public safety, and that's what we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, we have gone back to the basics, which is, and it goes to the efficacy argument of, of getting back our reputation and getting back the trust from the community. We've got our officers out of cars, interacting with the community, building relationships. If I were to look at a shooting that occurred of a, a young child in a park, we had 200 people who witnessed it. And I know who did it because people called anonymously, but no one has come forward to say they'll testify. We had a shooting in an area which would be blue under the, uh, the, the, the geocoding map of Chicago. And within five minutes, we had five people who gave us the plate number of the car and have already prepared and testified. And that shoot is off the street. So that's impacting violence. They're not shooting other people. Um, so the commissioner has tasked us with trying to build our relationship back with the community. We've squandered it. Police in general across the country have had reason for mistrust. And we've, we're in the process of trying to rebuild that back. So building that reputation, well, looking at crime to make sure that we're putting people where they should be. We're reaching out to um, everyone who's impacted by it. The health department looking at um, impact players. Well, maybe the impact player's solution has got to be that he's got to go get to jail and get arrested. We can't change them from where they are. But their younger brothers and sisters and their family, maybe we can intervene to protect, prevent that next impact player from coming up on the radar screen and trying to have a holistic approach of city services, whether it's schools. Uh, there's a, one of our colleagues from the TYS is out here is always out uh, making sure that kids that are on our radar screen are, are being contacted. Uh, the health department, uh, city services. Uh, the commissioner and the mayor are quite keen on making sure that basic city services, cleaning up neighborhoods, the Dr. Kelling's broken window theory are in play, that police officers are working with the mayor's neighborhood services reps, making sure street lights are on, uh, trash is cleaned up, and we're dealing with issues around the community. So that's, that's kind of where our focus has been reinventing the the stuff that's worked in the past. Perfect, thank you. Community building. Okay, we're gonna take a few questions. I'm just gonna ask the, the people asking <coughs> questions if they could keep the questions brief. Yes, over here. Hello, Please identify uh, yourself also. Oh, sure, Prabal Chakrabarty, I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Uh, my question, you've talked a lot about the research collaborations between universities. Um, Harvard doesn't have a recruitment problem because of hotspots are too close or lousy downtown, but other universities do have that problem. Are there things that they can do um, in, in those places that do have a problem with crime that's proximate to the university? Well, I, I mean, I know the city of Boston has a, a lot of very productive relationships with, uh, with universities, and if you look at one of those robbery hotspot maps that I put up, uh, a lot of the street robberies in particular areas are driven by students who aren't paying attention to their surroundings. Uh, these happen to be uh, locations where you have lots of good potential targets who are carrying uh, iPhones and other things that are very attractive to robbers. And there's these education campaigns that universities take on in order to you know, educate you know, folks in these hotspot areas to change their behaviors. You know, and sometimes that's more effective, sometimes it's less effective. But, but you know, and across all the, the universities, and I know there are a lot in this room, there's, there's a lot of good work that's being done and people who are getting out there and working with the city of Boston to, to improve conditions all over the place. I know that Northeastern and some of my colleagues there in particular with uh, hot spots throughout the city have been doing lots of interesting studies. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good work that's being done. Thank you. We're gonna go over here. Um, my name is Kathy Rabool. Um, I've worked at, with DYS with youth who've committed homicides. I've also took a class um, with the FBI on violent crime behavior, and um, someone there interviewed 500 rapists. And I was very interested, is, has anyone um, done a you know, very comprehensive study with impact players and really looked at, 
various factors and then try to take the factors such as trauma, et cetera, and then backtrack it and stop some of the things that are either causing them to become high impact players? I think, I think we've, uh, I don't know that we formally studied it. I think we have some uh, research that shows some of the things, single parent homes, drug abuse, uh, getting out of the education system, uh, use of uh, alcohol, tobacco early on. Um, we're seeing, we've got some research going on with MIT now where the chlamydia rates are, are, are showing us a, a correlation to people involved that are engaged in violence. But I don't think there's been a holistic approach to research impact players. One other thing I'd add is lack of a close relationship with a caring adult. We are going to end there just because we, we did start late. Um, and uh, the speakers um, will be here for a couple of minutes at least if there are some burning questions. But I want to thank um, this really phenomenal panel for kicking off what I think is a, a tremendous day on a critically important topic in our city, uh, violence. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you.